the gate of freedom is open in India. In Karachi, capital of the newly created Muslim state of Pakistan, Lord Louis Mountbatten, last Viceroy of India, arrives to take part in the official end of British rule. With Lady Mountbatten, he enters government house for the ceremonies which make Pakistan a full-fledged dominion. Next to arrive is Mohammed Ali Jinnah, first Governor General. As his final official act, Lord Louis delivers a message from the King. As Lady Mountbatten and Jinnah's sister Fatima listen, the Muslim leader replies with assurances of goodwill. With these brief ceremonies is completed one of the most momentous political transitions in modern times. The new flag of Pakistan flies over a nation of more than 80 millions, the largest Muslim state in the world. India's partition is completed the following day as thousands of Hindus in New Delhi swarm the streets awaiting their hour of liberation. On this historic occasion, the first constituent assembly is addressed by Prime Minister Pandit Nehru, political leader in the fight for independence. Three hundred million Hindus enter the British Commonwealth with Lord Louis Mountbatten as their Governor General. Carefully laid plans for celebration go by the boards as delirious crowds break through police lines in a near riot. So India, with over 380 million people and a hundred creeds, now has two flags flying. One of the Earth's ancient civilizations, her future is beset with strife, but her people are free. Seventy years ago this year, the great Indian subcontinent was partitioned. The partition was a direct outcome of over 150 years of direct British rule by the British Empire, which transformed the subcontinent and exacerbated many of the divisions that existed within it along ethnic and religious lines. The question was raised at the time, prior to the partition happening, whether this was inevitable. And the answer is, it wasn't inevitable. Uh, but it happened because the British had no serious alternative plan in 1947, and the Indian political parties, mainly the Indian National Congress, was not making sufficient concessions to the Muslim minority uh, in India to guarantee a unified India along democratic lines. It's a long story, and it's an old story. But what we have to remember is that up to two million people died. Just two years after the conclusion of the Second World War, millions were dying in India. And there was an irony that the imperial rulers of the country were safe and sound. No one touched them. Those who were killing each other were the citizens of India, Muslim versus Hindu, Sikh versus Muslim. And in the two areas where there were large numbers of uh, uh, killings, northern India with the Punjab, the largest and most significant province in terms of political power and military power during the years of the Raj was divided. And Bengal in the east was divided into two parts, East Bengal and West Bengal. Lord Curzon had tried out a dress rehearsal for the Bengal partition in 1906, which was unpopular and under mass pressure, Bengal was united again. But these two provinces, Punjab and Bengal, uh, were where most of the trouble was. And the trouble was man-made, man-created. We still do not have the exact figures of the numbers of people who died. Uh, but it varies from a million to two million. Why such a big variance? Because large numbers of people were burnt in mass graves, their deaths not registered, mainly the poor, or buried, in the case of Muslims, in mass graves, 
uh, and their deaths were not registered. Or you could have a situation where the death of the family member, the patriarch, was registered and no one else. That's why there is a huge variation. But all are agreed that at least a million plus people died in this uh, subcontinental uh, frenzy which made people crazy. It always happens when partitions take place, when people turn on each other. And this was a particularly unpleasant partition because it was based on communal lines that India would be divided into two countries, India and Pakistan. Pakistan would comprise the Muslim majority parts of India. So the rationale behind the creation of the new state was religious and ethnic. Uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, himself totally secular, not an ounce of religion or religious fanaticism in him, once explained the reason for the partition after it had taken place, or possibly just before, to an American journalist who said, why are you pushing for partition? And Jinnah replied, the Hindus worship the cow, we eat it. Now, this was, of course, very witty, but it was not at all based on historical reality, because the question could have been posed for several hundred years before the British came, how is it that by and large the two communities, Hindu and Muslim and the others, Sikhs and Christians, lived more or less in peace? That the Mughal Empire, the great Mughal kings who ruled large parts of India for hundreds of years, had armies with generals and officers and soldiers belonging to all communities. So how come that cow eating hadn't become a big obsession then. But the reason, the real reason was that Jinnah was fearful that the size of the Hindu community was so huge that Muslims would be crushed in a united India sooner or later. And even though he was prepared to accept compromise proposals, when the time came to do so, it wasn't Jinnah, but the Congress leadership, which refused to accept the cabinet mission plan uh, which Britain proposed in 1946, which would have spared a lot of the slaughter. So it happened. And what happens when minorities <clears throat> or communities are told to leave one part of the country and move to another part. They have to leave ancestral villages. They have to leave homes in which their families have lived for centuries, literally. They have to pack all their belongings and move. For the wealthier uh, people who moved, it wasn't a huge problem. But it's the poor, as usual, who suffered. The peasants who had to leave the villages working class families who had to leave the towns. And one can't ascribe more blame in terms of killings to either the Muslims or the Hindus and Sikhs. All sides did it. And the images from that period, images that I grew up with, because though I was only uh, approaching um, four uh, when partition took place, the memories were very vivid in the years that followed. A city, a city where I was born, the city of Lahore, which my parents remembered as a vibrant cosmopolitan city with all different groups, cultural, religious, with a very active cultural life. This city had been ethnically cleansed. And my earliest memories of partition are sitting in the back of the car as my parents were driving through the city to get somewhere or the other, and suddenly they'd point at a house and say, X lived here, or Y lived here, and talk about it to themselves. 
And you then grew up with the realization that actually the city that I was growing up in, a very wonderful city, by the way, was very different from the city that my parents had grown up in. And that older generation, my parents' generation, for them, partition was very painful. Even though we didn't suffer, we didn't have to move, we happened to be in Lahore and, uh, you know, uh, in the north of the country. And so nothing happened to us. But the stories of people who had to move, who were fleeing, refugees on foot, refugees on bullock carts, refugees packing trains, both sides, trains being stopped halfway by armed gangs. And when they arrived at a station on either side of the new divide, every single passenger had been killed. These were death trains. And the memory of these trains literally sent some people mad. I remember speaking uh, <clears throat> with a writer, uh, someone who later became a writer, and discussing partition uh, with him. And he confessed to me. He said, I was working as a railway clerk at the railway station and seeing these trains arriving filled with dead bodies and you open the doors of the compartments and people just fell out. Dead bodies fell out. He said, I had never ever thought of myself as someone who was deeply religious. Uh, <clears throat> I was a Muslim that I knew, I believed in the faith, but I was never a fanatic or religious, but th this caused me to do something which I can still not understand and which drives me a bit mad and I haven't talked about it to anyone for a very long time. So I said, what did you do? And he said, I went out of the office, my office at the railway station, went to a part of Lahore where I knew there were still some Sikhs. I'd taken a dagger with me and I just stabbed a Sikh in the heart and killed him. I have no idea who he was or whether he had a family, I just did it. I, I was pretty shaken on hearing this because the guy was very rational, very intelligent, and he said a madness gripped us all. And uh, the, the slogan was, the revenge for blood is blood. So this madness swept all over North India and the celebrations of independence were marred by the tragedy that had taken place that people tried to forget. Because on the one hand, 1947 was the year that India became independent and Pakistan, or Pakistan was created as an independent state. At the same time, people in the northern and eastern parts of the country felt a tremor saying, what, have, what has happened? What have we done? what is going to happen. And the idea was, which now seems so naive as to be laughable, that the people who created Pakistan, Jinnah in particular, felt that Pakistan would just be a smaller version of India, except that in Pakistan the Muslims would be a majority and the Hindus and Sikhs a minority. That's all. Otherwise, it would be the same. Uh, <clears throat> it would be closer to the West, Pakistan, closer to the British, but no nothing too different in terms of social structure and cultural makeup as the rest of India. Why was this naive? Because if this was the case, then you didn't need two separate states. You needed a confederation of some sort with iron caste guarantees for, for minorities. Whether this would have worked or not is difficult to say now. Very difficult to prove, especially with India currently being ruled by the BJP, uh, with Narendra Modi, an open 
killer of Muslims as the Prime Minister of India, with attacks on Muslims and Christians and low-caste Hindus, low-caste within inverted commas, Hindus taking place in India regularly, and all this, the, the extremity of the present Indian government, of course, was, is the exact opposite of what existed after partition, i.e. Nehru and Gandhi. Though Gandhi, for protesting against the deaths of Muslims, was assassinated by the people who are currently in power and whose leaders have no real, uh, they're not really upset that their forebears killed Gandhi. They don't feel that that was a wrong thing to do because they said Gandhi was getting too soft on on the Muslims, and uh, business had to be carried out. So it's a, it's a grim story. And it's very difficult now to say what would have happened had there not been a partition. Often people now point to India today and say, well, look, this is what would, would have happened to the whole country had uh, partition not taken place instead of you know killing 10,000 here, 30,000 30, there, they'd have been destroying us, against which there is a counter-argument that had the Muslim-majority areas remained part of India, there would have been a very sizable Muslim minority, not too easy to tyrannize, or which would have organized itself. The other irony of partition is that the main religious groups within Islam, the Deobandis, the jamaat -e islami and other groups described today as fundamentalists, were actually opposed to the partition of India. They said, we are not in favor of a Muslim state. Their theory, of course, was we are in favor of trying to win over the whole of India to uh, Islam, so why should we accept a tiny little Muslim ghetto? This embarrasses them today because they're very strong in Pakistan in many ways, but at that time, that was their official position. Pakistan, like Israel, was the creation of secular-minded Muslims who did it for not for religious, <coughs> but for political reasons. And it's rare to find in Jinnah's speeches too much about religion as such. He was an extremely gifted lawyer, one of the best defense lawyers in the country, living in the cosmopolitan city of Bombay, now Mumbai. And he actually believed that after partition, he would still be able to spend the winter in, in Bombay. I mean, that's how far he and others were from reality and on both sides. No one predicted the slaughters and the massacres, and yet one feels that they should have. And the fact that they still haven't come to terms with what happened 70 years ago is indicated by one stark fact. There is not, to this day, a single memorial for the victims of partition, the people who died. But the bulk of the people who died were poor people, of course. But there should have been, on the border, a giant memorial commemorating deaths on both sides. Instead, I hear that this week, the Pakistani government unfurled the largest flag in history on the border, at the border crossing where lots of people died. It's, I can't remember now what the size of the flag is, but it's on a huge flagpole and it's extremely large, as if saying to the Indians, our flag is bigger than yours. I'm sure they're equally stupid, the Indians. They'll soon build, you know, create another flag and say, it's our, ours is bigger than yours. That's the sort of level at which the 70th anniversary of partition <coughs> and independence is being celebrated. What were the ideas that followed in both countries after partition? For the new Pakistani state, the one thing that was not permitted was democracy. It was the bureaucracy, the administration, 
administrative service and the military later on that effectively ran the country. In India, which claimed to be secular and holier than thou, the principles of partition that all the majority areas, the areas where a majority of the people were Muslims, would be allowed to choose which part of the country they wanted to be with. The one area that was not allowed a vote, though a referendum was promised, was Kashmir. And in this area, in Kashmir, we still have an occupied country with Indian troops in their tens of thousands appearing to the local population. And the situation has got much, much worse over the last 30 years as an occupying force, rapes, murders, assassinations, killings are common. The image of Kashmir as a tranquil paradise disappeared a long time ago. And here, one has to say very bluntly that the people responsible for this situation are not the current rulers of India, who of course support it, but the legendary leaders of Indian independence, Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, the first two leaders of independent India. They are the ones which, who carried out the occupation of Kashmir, and Gandhi venerated today still as the apostle of peace and nonviolence, agreed to the Indian army taking Kashmir by force. So political principles lie heavy once state interests get involved. The other thing that happened in another state in the heart of India, Hyderabad, there were killings because here too there was a huge Muslim population, a tiny majority, who the Indians were not going to allow to join Pakistan, and nor did the Pakistani leadership seriously want it. But there was a rebellion and 40,000 Muslims died. These are, you know, very soon after partition. So 40,000 in Hyderabad, the occupation of Kashmir, made a mockery of the notion of a secular India right from the beginning. And this was underestimated by many people. So what happened to India we see now in its you know, everyday life where we have a government determined to create a Hindu state and uh, punish the minorities for being Muslims. The big attacks on Christians do take place, but the main target in India is the uh, uh, Muslim population. And one thing partition did for them, even though there are millions of them, there was a time when there were more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. I think that still is the case. Though if you combine Pakistan and Bangladesh together, uh, they probably have the edge. But these Muslims, whenever they protest, criticize, demand basic rights for themselves or the areas where they live, are often greeted with uh, abuse and chance of, if you're that keen to be Muslims, why don't you go off to Pakistan? So the life of Indian Muslims was made impossible after partition. Many families I know who would have stayed on in India, and these families include uh, people there whose children were friends of mine and still are in many cases. They just said it was impossible for us to remain in India. Life was made impossible. And a lot of poets and playwrights and script writers and short story geniuses wrote one thing after, the other, after another, pointing out what a tragedy this had been. No one can deny that. It was a huge tragedy for the entire subcontinent, not just for the Muslims, but for the Hindus as well, given where they have reached. And of course, many of the Brahmins refused to accept what they call the low caste Hindus as proper Hindus. And their leader, Dr. Ambedkar wanted 
all the um, so-called low-caste Hindus to be removed from the register as Hindus. And here Nehru and Gandhi wouldn't agree. They wouldn't agree because had that happened, the size of the sort of pure Hindu population would have been far more balanced. Uh, and in a, in a way, it's a pity that didn't happen. It, it would have made the subcontinent a slightly, a slightly uh, different place. So this partition has affected, infected everyone. I've been talking about India, what it meant for India, that secularism became a joke. Secularism didn't mean equality of human beings under the same laws. It meant the same respect to all religions, something which is very different, and which actually then makes religion itself into a pillar, because you then speak of yourself, you're forced into a religious identity, whereas the other way of treating everyone as equal citizens would have been awkward for the Brahmins, but better in the long run for India as a whole. And that is where we are today. In Pakistan, Jinnah's Pakistan died in 1971, where the idea of creating a state based on Muslim majority lands didn't work because the Western Pakistani bureaucracy, military, and the Punjabi political class decided not to allow the Bengalis, who were then a majority of the country, political rights. There was a, the country's first ever general election in 1970, led to the Bengali nationalists winning a huge majority, being denied the right to rule the country as a whole. The army was sent in, and Jinnah's Pakistan ended in 1971. So the basis on which the country was created came to an end in India very quickly, in Pakistan in 1971. India managed to preserve a facade, and not just a facade, of democracy. The country was too huge to be ruled by the military till we have the current authoritarian semi-fascist government in India, which doesn't care a damn about democracy, democratic rights, or anything else. And we have a government in Pakistan <clears throat> which is so corrupt that it's a, a, a joke, a regular joke in the country, the degree of corruption by the two families which have ruled. And within these families, no prime minister coming from them, the Bhuttos and the Sharifs, uh, have ever completed their term of office. In fact, no Pakistani civilian prime minister completed their term of office. The country's first prime minister, Liaquat Ali Khan, was assassinated. The second elected prime minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, was assassinated. Bhutto's daughter, elected prime minister again, Benazir Bhutto, was assassinated. Nawaz Sharif has just been removed by the Supreme Court for corruption. So the, the situation in Bangladesh is similar. Their founding father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was assassinated. In India, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was assassinated, one of the major prime post-independence prime ministers. And we have a situation which um, is depressing for large segments of the population that lives in the country. So the ideals of independence as embodied both in the Indian political class, the Congress party, and in the Muslim League in Pakistan were never really fulfilled. In Pakistan is effectively run by the country's army, which is the most stable force in the country as well. In Bangladesh, which has a secular constitution, religious fundamentalists are running riot, and India I have already described. So the legacies of partition have not been particularly beneficial for people in all parts of India and in all three countries.